Having our prayers answered is a, uh, a beautiful experience. It's, uh, it's encouraging and uh, it makes you feel kind of special, you know, that the Lord actually answered my prayer. It's, uh, it's something that is supernatural. You know, it's not just like somebody calling you, you know, that's nice when you haven't heard from somebody in a long time, they call you, but when God answers prayer and you know it's him, that is a blessing. That is encouraging, it's strengthening and helps us to go on in our walk. These verses here, they teach us, if we pray according to God's will, uh, we will get his audience. He will listen to us and he will hear us. And, we, and it says that if we know that he hears us, we'll have the answer. So what should we be trying to do? Get to know him. And we also need to find out what God's will is. What is God's will for us corporately? What is God's will for us individually? And as we begin to know that, then we, we know what to pray for. We can exercise faith in that. But if we don't know, you can't really exercise faith, right? Because you don't know what you're praying for. Uh, before we look at God's will, I'd like to discuss a bit of, uh, about uh, faith and some of the things that can hinder our prayers. Uh, it's important that we find out what God's will is. And it's important that we find out um, what it is that may hinder our prayers because you don't want to be praying and asking for something and, and your prayers are not being heard. You're not being listened to by the Lord for some reason. Faith is an essential part of receiving answers to our prayers, but it doesn't always mean that we don't have pray, uh, faith if our prayers are not answered, right? <clears throat> also, Having faith doesn't always mean that our prayers will be answered. So it's kind of a tricky situation with prayer. We don't know when God will answer our prayers and we don't know when he will not answer our prayers. So it's best then to love the Lord and accept what he has for us. Nevertheless, uh, prayer is definitely required. And here we see this. And he did not many mighty miracles because of their unbelief. So if we don't exercise any faith at all, then we can be assured that we will not have answers to our prayers. Um, there are three approaches that we can have while praying. Faith, presumption, and doubt. Which one do you think God will answer? Right, faith. Which one do you think we use the most? <laughs> you got it, that's it. Presumption, right? That's what we use the most. And knowing that we do that can help us to remedy that and turn that into exercising faith rather than presumption. Just a little bit on presumption and what it is here. Uh, assumption, believing something is true without evidence or proof. That almost sounds like faith, right? It's pretty close. Overconfidence, excessive confidence that can lead to taking things for granted. Arrogance, I skipped an arrogance, an attitude of uh, superiority, assuming that you're always right. Hastiness, acting or deciding quickly without careful thought. Entitlement. Expecting something without earning or deserving it. Now, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, and we'll just quickly go through this, verses 16 to 21, and we'll see here a person who has this presumptuous attitude. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain man, a rich man, brought forth plentiful, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So that is a, a, uh, an attitude of presumption. I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and everything will work out in such a way without praying and asking God. Because obviously it says that, you know, he didn't have, uh, and he was not rich toward God. He didn't give God glory. He didn't use his riches to glorify God in helping the poor, feeding the poor, helping people who didn't have. So uh, this was not a good situation and this shows us that this was a presumptuous person. Now I want to take a look at faith. When we look at faith, we usually think of Hebrews 11.1, 1, right? Does anybody know when that went off by heart? That's it, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. that's exactly it. And um, faith, however, has something more to it than that. That is definitely a description of faith, but there's uh, some parts of faith that we need to understand that if we don't understand, will um, prevent us from having our prayers uh, answered. Here's something about faith that's very interesting. Faith is the only condition upon which justification can be obtained. And faith includes not only belief, but trust. So those two aspects equate or make up what faith is. And so let's take a look at faith here according to a you know, dictionary. Trust, confidence in someone or something, often without requiring proof. Belief, accepting something is, that is true, often without evidence. Conviction, a strong, unshakable belief in something. Hope, expecting positive outcomes based on trust or belief. Reliance, depending on someone or something with confidence. And so here is a, an example of uh, trust and belief. We're going to take a look at this a little deep, deeply here. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Well, what is it that he does? Is, is he believing or is he not believing? Right? Well, what he's saying here is something that we just read about. There are two parts to faith, belief and trust, or trust and belief. So it's as though he's saying, in my mind, I know you can do this but I just need help to believe in my heart that you will do this for us, all right? His prayer was answered and his disciples failed to heal the child and that probably contributed to his unbelief, part of his unbelief, right? So let's take a look at the words that he used here. First, believe from the Greek 40, well, this is from the Strong's Concordance, to have faith in upon or respect to a person or thing. That is credit by implication in trust, especially one's spiritual well-being to Christ. Believe, commit to trust, put trust in. And an unbelief is uh, faithfulness that is negatively, of, so excuse me, faithlessness, negatively disbelief, want of Christian faith, positively unfaithfulness or disobedience, unbelief. So these two things show us that there is a difference. One is the trust and the other is belief. So I, he trusted that, that Christ could do this. He heard that he, this is a sure thing that he can do, but I can't quite believe that he'll do it for me. So he needed to exercise the both. So the Lord helped him to exercise it and he ended up having his child healed. Doubt is another one, right? That can be explained in two ways. Uh, we can have uncertainty or willing disbelief. And that's all we really need to know about that. We kind of know what that is, but let's take a look at just one verse here but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, don't doubt, right? 
uh, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea with the wind, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So we need to make sure that we don't have doubt, absolutely. So why does God answer some of our prayers and not others? Why does God answer, it seems like, other people and not our prayers? We want to find these things out. There are times when things get out of control and we need answers right away. We want answers right away. We get um, anxious, you know, what can I, I need an answer for this because I'm, I'm falling apart or something is going wrong. I need help now. Lord, please help me. And it's like there's silence. And we want to know, is that silence because it's something that I did? Or is that silence because the Lord is testing me or proving me? I want to know. We need to know these things. Sometimes we can't always know, but there are certain things that we can find out to help us through that situation. And here's a, a perfect example of that. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. In other words, I keep praying. I'm not going to give up. Why aren't you answering me? And these are actually prophetic words of Jesus, right? These uh, precede, or this verse here precedes that. We are familiar with this. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from my, the words of my roaring? So even Jesus' prayer was not answered. So we have to expect that at times our prayers will not be answered. So here I'm going to give you some reasons why the Lord will not answer our prayers. We know, first of all, that he won't answer every prayer. That's understandable. But when there's a time that he doesn't answer our prayers and we think that he should, there's kind of a sense of abandonment. We feel as though, why is he not answering my prayer? Why is this happening? I, I've done everything right. I, I just I don't understand what's going on. So we have to, at that point, just trust in the Lord. Just exercise faith that what he is doing is good until we can figure out or find out what's going on and that the outcome will always be good. But there are times when we can have our prayers answered and they're not answered and it's purely because what we are like or what we refuse to do or not do. And so, it's also because of our sins or our lack of faith. And God will answer more of those prayers when we are in harmony with him. So before we can find out how to have our important prayers answers, we must know what not to do that our prayers, so that we can find out, or have our prayers answered, excuse me. Here's one that we're all familiar with but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So if we know that we're doing something that is wrong, we can expect that the Lord won't hear our prayers, right? So what's the solution to that? Stop doing it, right? Repent, ask for forgiveness, and the Lord will hear our prayers. Here's another one. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. So we want to hear God's law. Now that's not just referring to God's Ten Commandment law, because his, the Bible tells us in, in Psalm, I think it's 139, in some, anyway, one of the Psalms, that God's law is very broad. Right? It covers a lot, all, in fact, the whole of our lives. Every aspect of our life is covered by his law. So if the Holy Spirit comes to us and convicts us and we say, I don't want to hear that, I don't want to do that, then if we go ahead and turn around and pray, the Lord says, I'm not going to hear your prayer. Why? You don't even want to take my counsel. So why should I listen to your prayer? Not that he's being vindictive, but it's for our own good. We don't want to be uh, doing things that are wrong and head down this uh, wide road to destruction and the Lord keeps blessing us and blessing us and we're happily going on until one day it's too late and we're lost. This is the reason he does these things. 
Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. So we want to make sure that when the poor cry out, uh, a legitimate cry, right? Not just people that are just trying to scam others because there's a lot of those things going on. But when there's a sincere cry for help, we need to do that. And here's something else we're familiar with. Yet ye have not because you ask not. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So we don't want to just pray for things just for our own sake. Just because, Lord, I need a new car. I want a new car. You have a car that runs, it goes, you know, runs fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You just want to have a new car, you know. That's, uh, that's not something that the Lord is going to answer. When we have the need, he will. Here's something really interesting. All the ingenious subterfuges or trickery the devil can suggest are presented to his mind to prevent every good impulse, every faculty and power given him of God has been used as a weapon against the divine benefactor. So, although he loves him, God cannot safely impart to him the gifts and blessings he desires to bestow. So this is something else. This, this teaches us we need to be in harmony with God, doing his will, because if we're not, God will not give us these blessings because we'll turn around and use those blessings against God himself. And how would we do that? Well, primarily by using it in a way that won't bring glory to him. God gives us things and gifts so that we can bring glory to him because as we give glory to God through our, our lives, we receive more. We are taught, we learn more, we experience more of his love. So this is why the Lord does this. Those are some of the things that will prevent our prayers from being answered. And there are times when God is doing something in our lives and we're going through a difficult period and we just don't know why. We feel as though something is wrong. We can't get an answer. We just don't know what to do. We, everything we try, nothing changes. And we can think of Job in his situation. You know, he was being used by God in a good way to reveal to the universe the character of Satan and God's plan of redemption. And the beautiful thing about it is that after he had gone through all of the suffering, God gave him back twice as much essentially as what he had. He, is still used, Job is still used as an example today for us to learn from. So not only was he blessed in his life after that situation, but his, still, his influence is still being a blessing to other people even today. Now let's take a look at God's will. We know that uh, to have faith is God's will. He wants us all to have faith in Jesus. That's the foundation, all right? So here's what I want to use to find out what God's will is, and you'll see why. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now there are other wills that speak, or other verses that speak about the will of God, but this one I want to use because it covers pretty much everything, and we'll begin to see that here. Being sanctified includes being cleansed from our sins, revealing the glory of God, and fulfills one of the main reasons why Jesus came. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's what sanctification does. So that's the will of God. He wants us to be cleansed from our sins, because if we're not cleansed from our sins, we'll eventually be lost. A person that we just spoke about this morning, Judas, was not cleansed of his sins. <clears throat> he never repented, <clears throat> and he never changed, and so he remained 
the way that he was, bearing his own sin to the point where he took his own life. And if we continue as human beings to bear our own sins, we will have the same reaction when the plagues start falling. When Jesus comes to return, it will be, <clears throat> you know, let the mountains and the rocks fall on us, hide us from the face of the lamb. We will not be able to stand it. We will not be able to be in his presence. That's what happened to Judas. His mind was so messed up that he knew he could not face Jesus ever again. <clears throat> and he knew that his condemnation was sure. But this prayer, I'm going to mention it here, is six words that God will always answer. Jesus, save me from my sins. That prayer will always be answered. Jesus, save me from my sins. That's according to God's will. So we can know that he will answer that. So we can start there because it's a good place to start. Because if we're not saved from our sins, we'll be walking and living in our sins. And if we're walking and living in our sins, God is not going to answer many of our prayers. Only the ones that pertain to our salvation. Because he will not want to continue to give us things that we just read. And we end up turning around and using it against him, against his glory. And end up scattering people abroad. For example, if you have, you have it, you see it sometimes, you'll have, and God has a purpose for it, but you'll have unfaithful ministers who are corrupt, but they have a great wisdom or they have a great ability to um, communicate the gospel. That, that's, that's, God is not wanting to give that person more because they're going to be leading other people down the wrong path. But, so how do they get more knowledge? Well, who is an other cre created spiritual evil being that knows more of the Bible than we do? The devil. Satan does. He can teach. He can teach us. Absolutely. And he wants to do things like that. In fact, in the spirit of prophecy, it mentions that he even attempts to answer our prayers. So we need to be careful. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A, one, a righteous person is a, is a person that has been made righteous by God. Something he has received from God has changed him from an unrighteous, unjust person to a holy and righteous person. That is a miracle. That's something we cannot do. We like to try to do these things because it's in, within our nature. When we see ourselves as we are, we say, you know what? I want to change. I need to stop doing this. And so we try, we try, and what happens? We fail, right? We're, we're told that all our promises are like ropes of sand. <clears throat> but if we have this righteousness that comes from Christ, then we have our prayers are more likely to be answered. And Jesus put it this way. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Also this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So the only way to have our, where our prayers answered in the way that is for God's glory and for our good is to be a righteous person. That's our goal. That's God's will for us, our sanctification. Being sanctified means you're being made righteous. You're being made holy. You have the righteousness of Christ. You receive the mind of Christ. So if you have the mind of Christ, you're going to pray like Christ. You're going to walk like Christ. So. Just as surely as God the Father answered Jesus when he was here, he will answer us in the same way we, when we are in Christ, when we live our lives by the faith of Christ. And this is key. This is really important. And this is why the message of righteousness by faith is so important. And it is the last message of mercy to be given to this world. Because as people receive that, 
they are transformed and they can hear God's voice. In fact, I can testify to that and anyone else who has studied righteousness by faith and has come to the place where you can experience it and you can sense God changing you, you will read your word, you read the word of God and you will see things in the Bible that you haven't noticed before. You've read it many times, but all of a sudden it just stands out. It jumps out at you. You say, I haven't read that before. How come I didn't see that? You know? And that's because the Holy Spirit is enlightening us, giving us insight. We need to claim the merits of Jesus. What Jesus did in his life while he was here, we can claim as our life. What he's doing in heaven right now, we can claim for ourselves. We need to have a proper understanding, however, of righteousness by faith, because all error comes from Satan, right? There's no error that comes from God. So all truth comes from God. All error comes from Satan. We want to make sure that we understand it properly. There are some teachings that are in the world, some have crept into our church, that can hinder our prayers or can cause us confusion and not give us a proper understanding of what righteousness by faith is. Here's one of them. The unconditional pardon of sin never has been and never will be. Such pardon would show the abandonment of the principles of righteousness, which are the very foundation of the government of God. Amen. All right. So we understand what that's saying. It's pretty clear. God didn't just say at one point, I forgive everybody. That is not the plan of salvation. When you understand the uh, Old Testament sacrifices, you don't see that in there. Right? We, we have a sanctuary service that teaches us what Jesus would do for our salvation and how we are to respond to that um, plan of salvation. And here's uh, E.J. Wagner on the same subject. No one was ever saved simply by looking forward to a cross to be erected and Christ, a Christ to be crucified at some indefinite time in the future. And no one can be saved, no one now can be saved simply by believing that at a certain time in the past Christ was crucified. So it takes more than that. Essentially, no matter what we believe, the, the point of, of the plan of salvation is to save us from our sins, to change us from being carnally minded to spiritually minded. So that means if I read and memorize the entire Bible, if I could quote the entire Bible to you, if I could claim to you or show you step by step the plan of salvation, if I understand and accept the fact that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, if I accept the fact that he rose from my justification, if I accept the fact that he's in heaven, that alone does not change me from being carnal to spiritual. Information doesn't do that alone. It has to reach the heart through the impartation of the Holy Spirit, through the gift that Christ gives to us. So the, there has been a push for the last 50 years or so, probably a little bit more, to promote forgiveness and to suppress the gift of righteousness, excuse me, of repentance. And I've noticed it, I know you have, if you've listened to any sermons, you rarely hear that gift being spoken of. And it is essential because if we can't repent, we remain carnal. Repentance is what begins to crucify the carnal mind. Once repentance is thorough, the, the, the carnal mind is crucified and now we can have victory. Now we're capable of exercising faith. Just think of it this way. If you have a carnal mind, you're at enmity with God and you're at enmity with his law, right? That's what the Bible clearly states. How can you then have the capacity to or desire to even believe anything that God says about you? If God were to come to you and says you're forgiven, what would that do for the carnal minded person? 
he has no capacity to believe, doesn't want to believe, doesn't need to believe, doesn't think he's guilty at, at his very core, will accept that message and will enter into God's kingdom. Mm, let's, let's put it this way. His church, unconverted, unrepentant, unchanged, and this has been going on in our church for years and other churches, but in our church for years. And thus we have a church with many people who are unconverted and they don't understand the gospel. And so because of the fact that they don't understand the gospel, they have not received the righteousness of Christ. They don't have the mind of Christ. So when these false theories that have been flooding into our church come along, they readily accept them. And that becomes their salvation. For example, there's people who are teaching there's no such thing as a Holy Spirit. Well, if you have that mind, carnal mind, that, that's perfectly fine. You'll take that because you don't have to give up self. These, these thoughts are deep within our minds, deep within us, and control us to the point that we don't even see what's going on, what we're like. Just like we talked about this morning with Peter. Oh, don't worry, Lord, I will never forsake you. I'll die for you. And what happens? He tries to defend himself and then boom, he's gone, all the others are gone. They all thought that they would stay. Yes. They didn't know Christ, they didn't understand the plan of salvation. They were still carnal. But after the repentance of Peter, he wept bitterly. That's when he changed. That's when he could believe. That's when they got together afterwards in, at Pentecost and they confessed their unbelief because they saw now clearly because their carnal minds were repressed and kept down and they could see. They could understand the beauty of God and so they received even more power now to go out and proclaim this message. What was it that they were pro proclaiming? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Righteousness by faith. Paul said the same thing. He preached everywhere he went. We see that in Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. So I completely went off script here, but that's okay. Uh, we need to allow God to work in us this beautiful plan of salvation because as we do that, we have the privilege of not only uh, thinking to ask, but knowing of a certainty, God is going to answer my prayer, not because of anything that I have done, not because of any righteousness that I have, but because of his righteousness that he has given to me Amen. to save me. So now I can ask for something and I can be certain that he will answer it. Now again, there are certain things we don't understand that he won't answer, but he will answer much more of our prayers if we go to him in the righteousness of Christ. Having Christ's righteousness, we can know that we can have answers. And that's encouraging because it's not, we're not left to ourselves to try to make ourselves as good as we can so God will hear us. It's not up to us to try to do all these good works and to prove to God that I'm worthy for you to answer my prayers. Because guess what? That'll never happen. <laughs> That'll never happen, right? The only thing we can depend upon is Christ's righteousness as ours. And as we do that, we will have prayers. And you know, think of this more. As you study, and I encourage you, continue to study righteousness by faith. As you continue to study it more, tell yourself, God will answer my prayers more now. Be cognitive of the fact that this is going to happen so that when you do pray, don't do like you used to do, just pray and then get up and go away and forget all about the prayer. Right? We have to do something to show that we believe that that prayer is going to be answered. So start acting in harmony with the prayer. And when temptation comes and we pray, God says, we, we quoted it this morning, right? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation 
also provide a way of escape. We need to look for the way of escape, right? Don't just start, sit there and fight the temptation. How, Lord, are you going to get me out of this? One of the things that God says is in the book of Romans, overcome evil with good. Do something for somebody else. Pray, help, whatever it, it, it takes. Do something where you can see God that he will intervene in your behalf. Amen. We have a wonderful privilege of having the last message of mercy to give to this world. Do you really think God is not going to answer our prayers as we can go forward to bring this message to the world? He will most certainly. We have the message that he wants us to give to the world so that they can hear it and be sanctified and be transformed and become righteous. So he will answer our prayers, but if we just do it for our own glory, for our own selves, then he will not answer our prayers. But we need to receive that grace from him so that we can give this message to the world. And as we do that, we'll have a fulfilling life. There's nothing more fulfilling than living a life according to God's will and knowing that he's working in your life. So having the life of Christ and, and, and being able to, to say, as, with, as Paul did, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. Right? I no longer live, but yet Christ lives in me in the life that I live now. I live by the faith of Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. When we have that, we become a bright light wherever we are and whoever we're with. And as you are with people of like mind, you will draw closer and closer together. You'll have more power to do the Lord's work. This is why the Lord wants us to be together in a group, in a church. The more light we have, the brighter we shine, the more we can reach people. We simply have to work out a few things that we have in our selfish little characters <laughs> so that we can do this thing right. But uh, the Lord will bless us. I am thankful to be a part of this uh, remnant movement and I encourage you to continue to search, continue to read. There's a chapter that I encourage you to read this week. It's in the book Christ Object Lessons. All right? It's a beautiful chapter and it's entitled The Two Worshippers. One had uh, a self-righteous attitude, the other one had a very low opinion of himself. God answered one of their prayers. And so if we can look at that man's behavior and how he was made righteous, we would want to follow that. And it's encouraging. It's encouraging.